the first thing to, to say is that uh, this is an overview of, of history teaching, so it's not a project in any sense, uh, but it's also uh, coming from my perspective. There will be other perspectives in this room, so we, we'll indulge in multiple perspectives, maybe in the discussion afterwards. Um, I want to start with a distinction that uh, John Slater, former HMI in England, made and, and has been taken up by Christine Council at Cambridge. Uh, the distinction between the intrinsic aims of history and the extrinsic aims. Uh, if, we, if we take the intrinsic, history for its own sake, inherent value of the historical process, uh, preparing young people uh, to go forward to make a career out of history through GCSE and A-level, and maybe even to university and beyond. Uh, this might appear a very traditional viewpoint, but actually it's not. It could be highly innovative teaching. It could be teaching which is uh, developing high-level critical thinking, uh, introducing kids to multiple interpretations and multiple perspectives. Uh, um, but it's the point where the history teacher might say, that's my bit done. Yeah. I've fostered critical thinking, but it's for others to take that up or it's for them to go out into society and apply that critical thinking to whatever they want to apply it to. Um, and then we have extrinsic, uh, where history teaching is seen as wider than simply teaching good, effective, innovative, imaginative history. It's about history's social utility, uh, where you, you see your role as about being a change agent, um, uh, uh, where you're seeking to transmit values through history, and, and where you're making the links between the past and the contemporary explicit. So, I mean, for example, I could teach the Easter Rising, I could teach it really effectively, I could present multiple interpretations, but I could keep it back in 1916. Or I could teach 1916 and make connections with the modern Republican movement and that legacy and so on. So, you know, it's, it's, it's where, where do I see my role? And, uh, you know, I would argue that in Northern Ireland, uh, as a history teaching community, We've never had this debate. There are many, Headley, who are comfortable with the view that was expressed to you. Perhaps the majority over the last 30, 40 years are more comfortable in the intrinsic zone. There are others uh, who have gone far beyond that and, and would see their role as, as that, of, of that of change agent. Uh, what has happened is that successively, we've had three curricula, well, Two and a half, in a sense, we had the 1991 curricula, curriculum which moved us in a more extrinsic direction, particularly underpinned by EMU and uh, cultural heritage. We had a revision of that in, in 96, um, which uh, Carmel particularly felt frustrated that the more extrinsic aims were being uh, ignored and she, she put them harder into the curriculum in 96. And then subsequently, we've had uh, the 2007 revised curriculum, which I think takes that agenda much further. But I think what has tended to happen is that many history teachers have read it, but they haven't gone with it. So there's, there's been, I think, a sort of passive resistance to some extent in the history teaching community. Uh, or among some in the history teaching community towards those more uh, extrinsic aims. So, let, let's sort of take stock of uh, where, where we're at with the uh, 1991 to 2007 curriculum. I've drawn on, on uh, my own research with Keith Barton, but also the CRC report. What did that curriculum achieve? Well, uh, I think it achieved a hell of a lot in that in a country that was still in conflict in 1990-91, it got Irish history put at the core of the curriculum. 
Uh, how did it do that? It did that, I think, by not putting the emphasis on a single narrative, on a master narrative that might be the case in, in many societies uh, which teach history in schools. It, it did it by putting the emphasis on the discipline, on the process of history. Uh, the amazing thing was that if you go back to 1990, 89, 90, there was a history war going on about what was put in the curriculum in England uh, around Kenneth Clark and, and where history stopped and, and uh, all hell was breaking loose in the House of Commons. When the Northern Ireland curriculum was introduced here in 91, there was hardly a political squeak, which I think is fascinating. And it perhaps <laughs> says something about what our poli the, the, uh, the, 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 how our politicians judge the power of education <laughs> for change, <Yeah. laughs> that they were uninterested. Uh, <laughs> What our research showed that uh, young people do value the history that, is, that was taught in schools. And our research was about 2002 3 so it was the old curriculum. But young people recognised that history taught them something different. It offered them something different. Uh, kids would say, it gives you two sides. Or it, it, it gives you the real story. Uh, so there was a valuing of what they were taught. There was also uh, a process going on, we felt, which very much interested us. There is a view, uh, people like Virch and others, who, who talk about you know, where you have a, a history curriculum, and let's say in the, the Baltic States, uh, under the Soviet Union, there was a, an official history taught to young, youngsters. And uh, the Russian kids in the Baltic States grabbed it and believed it. The Latvian Estonian kids heard it, wrote about it, but they knew that the real history was the history they learned at home. So there's this sort of appropriation or resistance. Now what we found interestingly in Northern Ireland that that, that wasn't the dominant model. What we found was that, that young people were drawing on history they learned inside schools and outside school, uh, history that they learned in all sorts of places. And they were struggling, they were wrestling. There was this internal persuasive dialogue going on. They were trying to make sense of all the history that they encountered. And that may be, can't say it more tentatively than that, it, it may have had something to do with the fact that the emphasis was on the process rather than uh, the, a, a single narrative. However, there were also big limitations. Uh, Headley talked about uh, people saying to him, you know, history in school taught me to be sectarian. There's no great evidence, uh, and I'm sure there are exceptions, but there's no evidence through inspector inspectorate reports and so on that the, the teachers go out deliberately to teach history in a, in a particular way. Many history teachers, I think, try to be fair and balanced to the point of blandness, and certainly our textbooks Alison Kitson, when she did some work in our textbooks, referred to them as bland uh, in, in the way that they presented the past. But what our work did show was that as kids got older, as they became more politicised, they were more likely to cherry pick the history that they were engaging with in school to suit their growing political narrative outside school. So as they became more politicised, uh, they, they would draw on uh, those events that suited their version of the story that they were learning. So maybe in spite of, rather than because of what was happening in school. Um, when we looked at, at, at individual groups of, of young people, uh, it became clear that even though they valued school history, they, they, they were struggling to move beyond their own commu community in, in, uh, interpretations of the past. In other words, we shouldn't underestimate the power of collective memory of, a, of the imagined past. Uh, so uh, the lens by which they viewed the history was likely to keep them in the position that they were in. Uh, certainly there was a real frustration, which came out even more strongly, I think, in the CRC report, is that, that young people actually want to know about the more recent past. 
They know there were troubles. They know it's about them and us. Uh, but they don't know why. And they find it quite hard to find out why. Or they get very garbled or uh, uh, very pushy offy type of versions. So when teachers say, I don't want, I don't think my young people are ready, or I would fear a backlash from the community, much of the time I think they're saying, I'm not ready, I don't want to deal with this. It's easier to keep it at a distance. A couple of, of uh, interpretations here, or three, four interpretations, possible things for, I want you to think about. Could it be maybe that th the reason that, that uh, kids value school history as giving them different points of view, but it doesn't seem to have a huge impact on the way they think? Could it be that maybe as teachers, we're better at talking that rhetoric than practicing the pedagogy? So I'm suggesting that maybe there's a gap here. You know, teachers know why history is a good thing. They know why it's important that kids should know. They understand that it's coming. It should teach about different perspectives and different interpretations. But if they haven't got the pedagogy to carry that out in practice, uh, then it's not surprising then that it maybe isn't as effective as it might be. Multiple perspectives or dual perspectives. I think we have uh, perhaps been too ready to teach the unionist point of view, the nationalist point of view. And, and what we have simply done there is maybe to reinforce in, in young people's heads that this is an intractable problem. Uh, and I think it's really important when we're teaching history that, that we start looking for those who didn't think the same way as others, those who thought differently. We must start to see this as a continuum of viewpoints, let's say on home rule, for and against, and to recognize the mavericks who thought the other way, who acted the other way, who did things differently. So that they can see that while those may be in a considerable minority, uh, others of my community thought differently. And we should be not exaggerating those positions or not exaggerating commonality of experience. That isn't good history if it ain't there in, in large numbers. But, but recognizing <coughs> that those different positions exist. Also, have we, been, have we placed too much emphasis on the cognitive uh, as opposed to the affective dimensions of learning? You know, have we uh, source A, source B, Source C, uh, you know, let's stand back as good historians and evaluate, you know, rather than engaging kids maybe with the more emotional dimensions of those documents or people's stories or whatever. Uh, so, you know, if I think if we get too cognitively uh, focused, uh, it's easy to suppress the effective. Obviously, if it's too emotional, we end up in a bun fight and uh, and and it gets destructive. So teachers being more aware of that cognitive affective balance, um, I think is, is, is something that we, we, we've maybe just put too much emphasis. The disciplinary approach to teaching history has maybe been a bit too cold, a bit too standoffish, and, and not in letting young people engage with more difficult issues and, and more difficult stories in a way where they, they, they really begin to get into uh, real issues. Uh, and have we kept our history too much in the past? Shh. I would argue that it's vital that when we're teaching history, uh, we don't simply talk about the past and then link it to the present in the last five minutes of, of, of the unit. But teaching history, there should be a constant dialogue between past and present, making connections with the contemporary, uh, uh, but nevertheless making sure that the, the history that we teach is rigorous. Okay, um, so we've moved on. We've moved on to the 2007 curriculum. And it has a lot of Carmel stamp on it in, in terms of, of the history provision. Uh, for a start, 
it offers teachers wide flexibility to choose what they want, what meets, meets the needs of their young people, as Michael was referring to earlier, uh, within a prescribed framework. And you know, that framework is, has strong extrinsic uh, dimension to it. How history has affected personal identity, culture, and lifestyle. How history can be interpreted selectively. How history can be used to build stereotyping. How history can be abused to justify contemporary views and actions. How historical figures have behaved ethically and unethically in the past. And the one reference to prescribed content in the new Key Stage 3 curriculum that young people should <coughs> study the causes and consequences of partition in Ireland and its influence on Northern Ireland today. It doesn't say the troubles, but it would be hard not to come to the conclusion that they are indicating that the curriculum should carry on to the present. My argument is that, that the curriculum generally, the revised curriculum, is a very radical curriculum. And, and the history curriculum is radical. So radical that nothing's changed. <laughs> there, there, in a sense, it was asking for too much change. And by giving people the flexibility to, to design their own curriculum, the vast majority of schools, in the short term anyway, thought, well, we've got the books. We've got 10 years, 20 years of, of work in these topics. Let's just tinker with them, try and make them fit, and continue as we have before. The one thing that I suppose has, has been a catalyst for change is this causes and consequences of partition. Because you can't teach up to 1921 only and not deal with that. And, and because there was no in-service support for this, because there was no help, I think it was convenient for schools to continue to do what they'd always done. But I do see, saying to Donald earlier, you know, I do see some schools that are beginning to change. And not just in, in the uh, non-selective sector. One or two grammar schools, really interesting curricula at, at Key Stage 3 um, um, that, that are, are doing things differently. But that change has been very slow. And in general, uh, sadly, uh, the curriculum is not being used to its full potential. So it's less the policy that's a fault than... Uh, than it's not curriculum as intended, it's curriculum as practiced at the moment, where, which, which is falling short. Okay, so what, what can uh, history do in the transitional justice process? This is maybe where I, 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 I get a little bit more uh, out on a, a limb. Um, there's a, a lady called Martha Minow who teaches at Harvard, and, and she makes a distinction between psychological truth and historical truth in the context of dealing with the recent past. She would uh, see psychological truth as, as often being traumatic, dealing with, with people with the, with the trauma of, of, of violence. Uh, it's cathartic in the sense that people need to tell their stories. That is the, the emphasis on, is on, quite rightly, on having your story told and less about critiquing that story. The important thing in the aftermath of conflict is that these stories are heard and listened to and recognized and acknowledged as genuine. But that is not historical truth. Those are fragments of truth. Historical truth, she would argue comes later. How much later, she's not sure. Uh, uh, and historical truth is, is, it sort of builds on, on Donald Shriver's idea of, of dialogical truth, bringing stories together. But crucially, I think putting those stories through a critical lens. That's where the disciplinary process of history comes in. Uh, but it's not cold. Because those stories are powerful. Keith Barton, who I work with, talks about different dimensions of empathetic understanding. There's empathetic understanding, which is about understand, quite a, a quite uh, cognitive idea, where 
uh, you try to understand why somebody acted in the past in the way they did. But another dimension of empathy, he would argue, is this idea of caring. If kids don't care about people in the past, they don't care about the people they're learning about, then they're not going to, uh, they're not going to engage and the history's going to wash over them. Okay, so it's critical. It puts those stories of the past through a critical lens. Uh, but it also helps young people to synthesize those stories. Uh, so it's the coming together of those stories, but the recognition that those stories, however genuinely told, may not be the whole truth or may even have got uh, them slightly uh, tainted or garbled by the circumstances in which they happened or whatever. Okay, now, in an ideal society, you would, I think, get the psychological truth on the table and you then, at a point in the future, as I suppose has is, 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 is happened in South Africa to an extent where Truth and Reconciliation Commission material is now in classrooms and being looked at critically. Uh, unfortunately in Northern Ireland, because we've never dealt uh, in any systematic way with the psychological truth, we're now a generation at least on. Young people need this stuff, want this stuff, uh, and, and we can't wait any longer. And yet, as, as Headley was saying, you know, this, there, there's danger of intergenerational trauma coming through and those things haven't been dealt with. But I think the time is now when we've just got to accept as history educators, we've just got to get on with this and we've got to, 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 look, to, to get into it. And, and you know, I very much value the work that, that uh, Donal and, and uh, Darren Scott and, and, and uh, Sean have done around uh, troubled tales. You know, and it seems to me that you know, a, a good project is to take year 10 youngsters and, and get them to investigate the experience of young people in their community or communities uh, through oral history. But bringing those stories together, maybe even engaging with the other community to hear those stories, uh, and, but synthesizing those stories putting them through the critical lens of, of newspapers of the time uh, and other documentary evidence and, and then coming out with an account of what it was like to live during the Troubles. Maybe a much greater emphasis on the social experience, but inevitably you're going to touch on uh, issues of, of, of uh, victimhood and, 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 and violence as you go along. Okay, so what, what, can, what is history's role? Uh, I would argue it's, it's, it's about challenge, it's about myth busting, and it's about helping kids to understand how history can be abused for contemporary purposes. You know, that, that's why politicians use it. They don't use, they don't, they're not interested in history, they're interested in using fragments of history to justify contemporary positions. Uh, it's a subject which should hurt your head. It's got to be complex. It's got to make kids think. It's, it's, it's got to make them uncomfortable, I would argue. It's about dialogue and debate. And it's about giving them opportunities to interpret the past for themselves. I would argue it's about metacognition. It's about helping them to understand why, coming from where they come from, they might interpret history the way they do. You know? uh, and that's as true of the academic historian as it is of the 11 or 12 year old kid. We all see the past through a lens, but it's being conscious of that lens, being understanding where you're coming from, that, that helps you uh, to, 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 uh, to see and therefore maybe to, to modify in the light of that experience. You know, I was telling um, somebody earlier, I had a, had a student teacher about five, six years ago, now teaching in, in an integrated school, uh, who, who won from Queen's in history. Uh, we went to Kilmainham, uh, we went to the courtyard, and I'm basically saying to them, get off your high 
professional horse. What do you feel like in here? What's the, your gut feeling standing in, in front of the, the trekler and where these men were executed? And, and she wrote about afterwards saying, I now realize that throughout my university career, I was interpreting history through the lens of the troubles. Uh, you know, so, so I think that makes her a, a stronger history teacher, now recognizing what may have influenced the way she sees the past. Uh, constant dialogue between past and present. Uh, critical examination of personal experiences. Uh, but I do believe that there is a point which history can go and can't go further. Uh, history is about providing an informed context for contemporary dialogue. I do not think that it should be the aim of history teaching to develop reconciliation. That lies somewhere else in the curriculum. Uh, because unfortunately, history ain't that neat. <laughs> History sometimes demonstrates that democracy doesn't work. History sometimes demonstrates that violence works. Uh, and we mustn't distort history in order to uh, help us cope with, 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 with social goals. There are other places in the curriculum which can take up that values dimension much more strongly. And so what I would argue for is a clear articulation of history's place in a connected curriculum, which is the vision of the Northern Ireland curriculum. Not much evidence of it out there, but it is the aim of the curriculum. Uh, and particularly, uh, understanding and developing this role between history teaching and citizenship. Uh, envisaging local and global citizenship as a place in the curriculum where young people have the space to talk about the issues that are raised in other subject areas. Uh, and and I, instead, it's seen as peripheral when that sort of space, to me, should be at, at the centre of schools.